was there me my shame You could carry that home away It was my tomb Till I made you Till I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name. And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is that I own. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, oh, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness to your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, to your glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Because when you call my name, Out of the darkness to your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Show you my who 
the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Worship, where we're able to sit in your presence and listen to your word while we listen to fun games and experience wonderful community. We pray that you give us the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and that you speak through Justin tonight. We love you. Amen. Y'all, there's still toilet paper up here. Lucas, is that for when you cry? <laughs> it's okay, man. Men cry. It's okay. Um, how may I, hey, hey, bud, how may I help you? You're a pedal. <laughs> may I pull it back a little? Just don't step on it is what somebody said. Push it back and I'm fine. <laughs> Much is gracious. Do I need help? James, I love your attitude. I got it, bro. You're good. Thank you. I can do it. I can do hard things. <laughs> say I can do hard things. I can do hard. Some of y'all need to say that for yourself tonight. Say I can do hard things. There you go. <laughs> uh, some of y'all made it real clear that when you get done brushing your teeth, you apparently like don't do the, let me make sure every nook and cranny of my mouth is clean, gargle and then spit. I don't know what y'all do. I don't know if it's just like a straight spit and then it's like smeared on your tongue. But uh, we got to work on your gargling skills. I think, I think what was happening is we took in too much water and you were trying to gargle with way too much in the mouth. So we'll keep working on it. Now, down here, ladies, are you guys okay? Do I need to find a therapist? Like some boys just started spewing, man. Like it was like water falling over here. Um, I have no budget for that, but I understand trauma's real and like, <laughs> we'll work through it as best as possible. Uh, will somebody give me a Braves update real quick? Seven to two. Phillies? All right. All right, guys, will you, uh, real quick before we jump in tonight, we're going to pray. We are going to pray seriously, but I'm also going to lift up the Braves because they're the, they're the home team, and y'all, I want a world championship, okay? That's what I want. But, um, just bow your heads with me. Let's, uh, let's enter before the Lord tonight. Dear God, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for the band. Thank you for their hearts to come and pour themselves out. Thank you for these students. We're so grateful they get to choose uh, this place and, and to spend time with us, Lord. And I pray that they would know that we want, to, we want them to be known and we want them to be loved. Um, I also lift up your nation, Israel, God. I pray for that whole situation, that you would just bring peace to the families of the innocents, 
God, I pray that this terrorist organization, that you just wipe them out. God, it's horrible what's happening. And I, and I know that Israel is special in your heart because those are your chosen people written all throughout time. And I thank you for the gospel so that we can be grafted into your family. But I lift up your people tonight, God, that we would just have hearts that bend toward them with compassion toward that entire situation and those that are hurting. And then, yes, Lord, selfishly, I do pray for the braves tonight, God. I pray that those godless fillies would just find somewhere else to worship. All right, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I don't know if y'all should have amen that last bit. There was probably some heresy in there. Somebody will watch that online and be like, no. Um, well, hey, welcome. We're glad you're here. This is one of the best nights of the week, in my opinion. I love Wednesdays. Wednesdays are my favorite. I wake up and I'm like, yeah, what's going to happen today? Um, but y'all, next week is the spookiest night of the week. And so you need to make sure that you're here in your costume, bringing a friend in their costume, and I don't know what I'm going as yet. All right, I'm going to be upfront about that. Last year, I went as like your typical like beach tourist dad, so I like had the Hawaiian shirt, had my sandals on, should have brought a camera, had my dad hat on, uh, but this year, I really want to go like to the next level with it. I'm thinking I might try and dress up as like Coach James or Nolan. I'm just kidding. That's not, that's too easy. It's too easy. So here's what, I, here's what I need you to do, is I want, I want you to text me this week, and if you're like, I don't know your number, I'll give it to you right now, but I want you to text me this week some costume ideas. All right, you ready for my number? Here we go. Everybody's about to have this. This is probably so dangerous. Uh, 770. <laughs> it's the most common area code, bro. All right, 881 Please for the love of everything that is good on this planet, tell me your full name when you text me. Because if it is an unknown number, I'll be like, that's cool, thanks for the suggestion. I don't know you. Like, I'm never going to text you back, okay? 770-881-5625. All right, I want y'all's uh, costume. I'm about to, like, dropkick my analogy. No, I'm just kidding. Um... Y'all, I hope you're, those of you going to fall retreat this weekend, so did I hear Nolan correctly that he wants to get videos of the dumbest thing I do, and then he's giving you money? Is that what I heard? I heard funniest, which usually translates as dumbest, so um, if that means me screaming on the Goliath swing, that's a pretty much solid bet. Poopy pole is usually fun to watch me fail, so be, stay tuned to our Instagram, I guess, because we'll be... I'll be doing things at fall retreat. Um, yeah, next week, don't forget costume bash. All right. So tonight, we are continuing in our series called Don't Be Afraid. And what we've done is we've planted ourselves in Mark chapter 5, and we're looking at primarily three stories, three examples where Jesus steps into somebody's anxious or nervous or scary. Like last week, we talked about this demon-possessed dude, and he didn't just have like one demon. Like it said he had a legion, which is like 2,000 unclean spirits living in him. And what we watched is Jesus step into these situations and bring hope hope, and he brought healing, and he brought peace. And so tonight, we're going to pick up right where we left off, and we're going to be in verse 21. So if you got a copy of the Word with you, there should be one on your seat. It'll be on the screen in a second, not quite yet. Uh, but we're just going to stick a finger there. Be like, I found Mark 5:21. I'm going to hold my finger right here in this spot, because I want to ask you this question. Now, I want to I make this clear. This is a question for you to ask yourself. Because what's going to happen is that three of you will not be listening to me right now, and you're going to yell out your response to me, and that's just awkward for everybody if you do, okay? And the question that I want you to ask of yourself, like internalize this, is this question, who are you? Who are you? I mean, another way to ask this question is like this, who or what do people say I am? Who or what do people say I am? For some of you, the, your answers are across the board, but it's easy, right? You're like, I'm the cool kid, or I got all the money, or people just love my winning personality. You know, I smile at them, and they're like, yeah, I'll give you, like, my pencil in class, right? So your answers are kind of all over. Maybe for some of you, you're known for a lack of personal hygiene. Look at me, middle school boys primarily, all right? Look at me, because a whole bunch of y'all are going to fall retreat this weekend, Bring deodorant, and you will take a shower this weekend. All right, I've said my piece. I, 
oh yeah, don't, no, if I say that, then they'll bring it. You have to, like, I'm not doing that, okay? My cabin, <clears throat> you guys will be sleeping in Jeff Paskey's bunk, or uh, his uh, cabin, so <laughs> you can bring your axe to that cabin. High school guys, we good, right? We, we chilling. All right, cool. Maybe you see yourself as, like, athletically or physically skilled. Like, you're known for being the jock. You're real sporty. You're like, I go out there, I win ball games. Like, I'm a baller like that. Like, I'm really, really good. Maybe for others of you, it's the amount of friends. Like, you're known for how many friends you have. Some of you, you might be known for how many friends you don't have. For others of you, it might be how many followers you have on Instagram or the views you get on TikTok. Like, you're known for getting TikTok famous. I don't know if that's still a thing. My wife only watches those cooking videos, and I just sit there and go, why did they make this app? I don't. I like quality time, and my version of quality time, y'all, is not you scrolling. That's a personal. That's an aside. I'm sorry. Um... There you go. That's what she's known for. But is there any part, I want to ask it like this, is there any part of your identity, of how you see yourself, of how you think about yourself, that has plagued you? Like it's followed you, it's tracked with you, it's been around you for like a long time, and it's, and it's not the thing that you want to be known for. Like this issue is not something you want to be known for. You're like, I really wish this wasn't a part of who I am or how people viewed me. Because it makes me hurt, and it stinks, and I'm, and I'm carrying this. Like, maybe for some of you, it's a battle with anxiety. Like, y'all, I've been there. That battle is real. And you're like, I've done all the things, man. I've said all the prayers. I've taken all the meds. I've seen all the therapists, and I still don't have relief. And it's plagued you. And now, whether it's you giving yourself that narrative or it's people around you, you're known for that one issue. Maybe it's a family thing. Maybe like you got a weird uncle or something and they know you for that. But maybe it's a little bit deeper where you've lost a parent or maybe your parents are divorced and you're known for that parental hole. They're like, oh yeah, his dad ran out on him and his mom didn't come back. Oh no, they passed away and now he's kind of goofy. Like you, you wear that hole, whether it's internally or it's externally, you're wearing it. Like my parents are divorced. My dad, not a good dude, like facing some jail charges right now for some really stupid decisions because y'all adults make dumb decisions, all right? Um, but like, he's not a good dude. And for a long time, the way I carried my identity was I have no dad. And I didn't know how to live up to things in life. I didn't know how to like step in, like what's it like to be a man? Because the only man I had in my household for a time was an idiot, and he like walked out on us and he said dumb things, lied to people, used people, abused substances, and we got a divorce for safety reasons. Like he was not a good dad. And so then I had this hole. Because you see, for some of us, the scariest thing on the planet is not spiders, though, ugh, see last week, right? I hate those things. The cold drives the Joros away. I'm very grateful. It's not spiders, it's not roller coasters, it's not scary movies, it's not clowns. For some of us, it's not even death. The scariest thing on this planet is the identity that we have and that we carry that we are unable to control. And we don't want to accept. Whether we put it on ourselves, because some of y'all, the identity you're carrying, the way you see yourself, nobody else knows that you see yourself that way. And for some of you, it's the, the voice of the crowd, the way they see you, they've told you, and you're like, I guess I'm nothing more than this screw-up because everybody says that that must be true. And that's really scary to live with. It's really scary to walk with. And it's really scary to do life in community with other people with. And a lot of us did not ask for these narratives or these identities. And yet, here we are. We're carrying some of this. So tonight, in Mark 5, what we're going to witness is a healing from this kind of affliction. There will be a physical healing, but you're also going to witness this radical healing of this woman's well-being and her mental state and ultimately her identity. Spoiler alert. And we're going to examine this relatively well-known story of this woman. And she has this ongoing issue. It's been with her for a long time. Scripture says 12 years specifically. And it's impacted even how she was known. And what we're going to witness is Jesus provides so much healing and peace and hope in this story. So if you've got your Bible, if you've got your fingers still there, let's read it together. Mark chapter 5, verse 20. 
1. The word says this, When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and kept begging him, My little daughter is at death's door. Come and lay your hands on her so she can get well and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd was following and pressing against him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Say worse. Good job. Y'all are on it tonight. So verses 21 through 23 are actually providing context and actually setting up what we're going to be talking about next week. But basically what's happening here is Jesus just finished with that unclean spirit guy, right? The the legion, the pigs, the bacon running off the cliff. If you're like, wow, I missed that, or I didn't know the Bible had stuff like that in here, you really should read your Bibles. It's a lot of fun. Uh, If if you find the Bible boring, you're reading the wrong parts, okay? I can help you. Um, But he gets done with that. He gets back on the boat. He travels back to the other side of the lake. The instant his his foot touches the shore, a huge crowd presses in around him. Immediately, oh, it's Jesus, oh, it's Jesus, oh, it's Jesus. And so they get around him, and then this guy named Jairus, and he had some power, some prominence. It said he was a synagogue leader. It means he was a leader in his culture, in his town. And so he comes up to me. He's like, hey, my daughter is sick. This is Jesus' schedule. This dude does not sleep or stop. So Jesus is like, okay, I guess I'm going with you now. And so he starts walking with Jairus. There's this big crowd. And that's when we then learn about this woman. And notice how scripture describes her. The first thing it says about her is that she was a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years. She's suffering from bleeding for 12 years. I want to point out, we don't know her name. We don't know her culture. We don't know her ethnicity. We don't know her family. We don't know her lineage. We have nothing aside from a condition. The identity scripture gives to us is a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years years. She had been suffering, and at least for 12 years. I think one time I pointed out that that's like if you were to start in kindergarten and go all the way through roughly your senior year, that's 12 years. That's a long time. A lot can happen, and for her, there was no peace. There was no rest. It's just constantly suffering. We don't know what kind of bleeding. doesn't matter. In their culture, if you had an exposed wound, you had open blood, it made you unclean, and they kept you outside of society. They kept you outside of community. And so she's alone, she's isolated, and she's in pain, she's suffering. You see, many of us suffer. Y'all, that's just natural, that's just part of life, I'm sorry, life is hard. And we suffer, we go through hard things, we experience hard things, we have a pain or a trial or a circumstance that never seems to end, or it changes to the next one. There may be small reliefs, right? There'll be small reliefs where like, ooh, things are good right now, and then it's that constant anxiety of, okay, when does the next thing happen? When, when will this friend stab me in the back? When will this group of friends share that gossip? When will mom get sick again? When will so-and-so abandon me? When will that boyfriend or girlfriend, are they, are they going to make it this time? Are they going to stick? And that anxiety starts to come back. And to quote a movie that none of y'all should watch, so I won't share the name of the movie, but the character says this, because this is how life is sometimes, is that it's a never-ending train wreck with momentary moments of happiness, where it pauses and there's happiness. And that's how life can feel, where it's just, what's the next train wreck? What's the next moment? What's the next thing that's coming? We suffer, and it's hard. And we begin to let these conditions, our conditions, define our identity. Now notice verse 26 says this, she had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. I have four thoughts based on these couple of verses right here on the condition of suffering. Number one is this, when you're suffering, we overspend on energy and resources. We overspend. This woman, it says that she spent everything she had. I'm not just talking money. She spent time. She spent energy. She spent emotions. She gave away of herself saying, please, 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 will somebody make me whole? 
Can I feel whole? Can I feel healed? Can I feel happy? We overspend. The second is this, we wish to be in control of our situation. We want to control the outcomes. We just want to feel better. And our instinct when under duress and stress and trial is to try and fix it in our own power or numb it in our own power. And we end up finding ourselves using different coping mechanisms and things to try and numb the pain or to hide what's going on with us. Number three is this, we try to fix it in our own power. Those two go together. The woman spent everything she had on doctors. She was like, these guys surely can make me better. I'll spend it all on them. And yet it says that she only got worse. So we do the same thing. We try to fix it. And so we turn to different coping mechanisms, whether that's like turning to our friends, just constantly word vomiting and dumping our trauma and problems on them. Maybe the things that you're looking at, it's not that you actually want to look at those things, but it's because that helps numb something inside of you. Maybe it's the stuff you're drinking, or maybe you're doing some drugs. Y'all, there's grace for that. We understand that a lot of us are walking with pain and we just want to feel numb to it. We're tired of suffering. Number four, the fourth thought about the condition of suffering is this. We are pushed to desperation. We will do anything to alleviate suffering. Y'all know this is true. Look at all the different types of researches they're doing to try and fix sicknesses and illnesses and, and help medicate because we're desperate. We're desperate to feel whole. We'll do whatever it takes And the world offers so many possibilities to try and fix the things that are going on with us. And I do want to pause and say this. I am not anti-doctors or medicine, y'all. I'm not trying to get up here and say, your faith is weak and you need to stop going. No, go to doctors. That's called common grace. That's like God gifted us modern science and doctors and they do wonderful things. Like go see a therapist if you need one. Go to a doctor, take medicine, get the arm brace and the back brace, old people, right? Like, do these things. What I am trying to say is that it may not be the entire answer or thingy to put your hope in. It may be that they're a part of the equation, a part of the answer, just not the entire thing. And so what tends to happen with these four things as we walk through these, we end up like this woman. We're in a place worse than where we started. We look back and we realize we've spent all of our money We've given away way too much of ourselves over to friends or boyfriends or girlfriends or family and we've overspent and then we wake up and we're like, man, this is not where I wanted to be. And this is not who I wanted to be. I'm drained and I'm tired and turns out this thing I'm wrestling with is still here. It hasn't left. And so it can feel hopeless. And this is the woman at this moment I truly believe that she's feeling really hopeless. She's on the outside of her community. She spent everything she owned. She spent all of her energy. And nothing's been able to fix her to help her. She's hopeless. And so this one random day at a random time, she hears about this man named Jesus and his his power and his healing. And a small flicker of hope begins to jump in her heart. She's like, man, if this guy really is who he says he is, there may be a chance Yet And so she risks it all. We're going to read this exchange, this moment where she's going to approach Jesus. And I just want you to know that for her to go into this crowd and the condition that she was in with a culture that said, you are unclean, stay away from community, was risking everything. She would be completely kicked out of her country at that point. Not just kept outside the city. She'd be shunned, kicked out, sent away, judged, condemned. So verse 27 Here's what happens. This woman, having heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his robe. For she said, if I can just touch his robes, I'll be made well. Instantly her flow of blood ceased and she sensed in her body that she was cured of her affliction. She heard about Jesus, that's it. She heard. She heard a rumor that there were healings and miracles and she steps out on faith that if he is who he says he is, as the prophets talked about, because she's hearing rumors that this guy's the Messiah. And the prophets talked about the Messiah and said, just to touch the wings of his garments, so like the, the fringe, we provide healing. She's like, if that's true, if he is who he says he is, if he's actually this person, then I only have to touch his garment to be healed. I don't have to talk to him. I don't got to see him face to face. I don't have to beg. I don't have to do seven different types of activities to be made right. I just have to touch him to be made 
whole. This is her last ditch radical effort to be healed. This is it right here. This is all she's got. This is the gamble she's running on. Because according, like I said, to her condition, to her identity, the woman with the issue of blood, she'd be kicked out. She'd be shunned. If anybody knew that she was among that crowd and knew who she was and what she had going on, she'd be out. And I think for a lot of us, we view our own conditions in the same way where we, we believe that we're unclean. And we isolate ourselves from friends and from community, whether we do it physically and we're like, yeah, I'm just not going there anymore. Like, I, I just ain't hanging out with that person anymore. Like, I can't trust them. They say these things about me and I believe this way about, I'm not doing it. Or it's, it's the social where it's, you've got friends who are friendly with you, but they don't know you. They don't know you wholly. They don't know the things you're actually working with. And so you're alone despite being surrounded by a lot of people and friends. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus can heal your condition? Do you believe that Jesus can heal your condition? Let me ask it maybe like a better way. Do you trust that he can? Do you trust that he can? Because that's faith. Faith. That word pistis I talked about a few weeks ago is when you move from, from belief, just a, I believe he can, I believe he's able, I believe this, to going, not just do I believe it, but I trust in it. I'm placing everything I've got in it that he will hold me up, that he'll make me whole, that he'll heal me. I trust it. Do you trust that he can? Do you trust that he's greater than the things you're wrestling with in this world? I want you to watch how he concludes this interaction with the woman. So verses 30 through 34 Here's what, uh, I gotta find it real quick. Here's what the word says. It says that once Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my robes? I love this exchange. His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you. Basically, yo, Jesus, there's a bunch of people here and you're asking us who touched you. Like, nobody can identify that for you, sir. So he was looking around to see who had done this. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came with fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Not just, hey, I touched your robe. Like she's talking like, I had this condition. I was bleeding. I was in a way. I felt this thing. I was identified. And here's what happened next. Verse 34, this is so powerful. He says, daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. I want you to notice that when this exchange happens, that Jesus takes the healing a step further. Yes, she is healed physically, but he also completely rewrites her identity. He restores her personhood. We know her as the one with the issue of blood or the issue of bleeding. And Jesus calls her daughter. He calls her daughter. That's two things. That's adoption and it's love. That's him going, I accept you. I invite you. I want you part of my family. Like, you're with me now. You're part of the crew. You're part of the fam. You're part of the clan. And then furthermore, to say, daughter, is I love you. Like, I'm glad you touched my robe. Like, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're still with us. I'm glad that you were brave today. And I love you for it. You're my daughter. That's what he did. He rewrites her entire identity. And friends, some of us tonight, we need to receive this. We need to receive that our identity is not in the things that describe us or how people talk about us or how we talk about ourselves. That's not our identity. Our identity is in who Jesus says we are. And this woman, he says, daughter. In a culture where she was unclean and disregarded, he paused and made space for her. Her. He was already on the way to some dying child. We'll talk about it next week. He's on the way, like this is an urgent matter. And he stops and he's like, no, no, who touched me? Because somebody else needs some healing today. And then he doesn't just say, hey, good job. Like your body is well. No, no, no. You are a daughter. Like you are loved. And he wants to do the same thing for you and for me. You see, this woman's faith is what made her well. She trusted that if she did this thing, she'd be made well. And Jesus says this, or he, he, he said this, what made her well was her faith. You see, her faith led her to peace and freedom because she acted. She has peace of mind. She's no longer certain who's gonna be kicking her out of the temple. She's got peace to come worship. She has peace to be part of community. She has freedom to participate in those things. And so some of us tonight need to model this woman. 
We need to be so radical in our faith as to actually take steps of trust. So here are some quick self-examination questions. Number one is this, where is my faith taking me? Where is my faith taking me? Am I walking and living with trust? Is there movement? Number two, am I even acting on my faith? Or is it just a lot of head knowledge? What will it take for you to be like this woman and say, even if I can just touch his clothes, I will be made well or whole? And then number three, do I believe in a faith that supersedes suffering? A lot of us believe that whatever is going on with us is too great for God. And so we choose not to act on faith because we're like, he won't heal it. He won't help me. He won't be with me. He's not here. He's not real. Do you have a faith that supersedes that where you say, Jesus is greater. He's greater than what I'm experiencing right now. And some of you haven't experienced the freedom yet because you've yet to trust that he is greater. So don't miss this tonight. On the other side of faith in Jesus is peace and freedom. On the other side of faith in Jesus, accepting the identity he has for you can come peace and can come freedom. Uh, Riley and Lucas are going to come back up here. They're going to very awkwardly reset their instruments um, back around me. Yes. Yes, right now. You're good. You're good. I, uh, I have just two quick invitations for you guys tonight during this time of response. Uh, the first one is, is this, is that you need to get on your knees and you need to declare that you trust Jesus is greater than your situation. And begin to declare that he is able to heal you, whether that's a real physical thing or this is some mental stuff, some identity stuff that you're wrestling with right now. And that you are not what your friends say, what family says, what your condition says about you that you are a son or a daughter who is dearly loved by their heavenly father. The second thing is this. There are some of you who are, you're like, I'm perfectly okay, bro. I got, I got nothing going on. Like I have, I trust that Jesus is who he says he is. I trust that he's greater. I believe the identity he has for me. Friend, let me ask you, maybe your response is that you begin praying for God to show you who needs to hear that same good news. That who in your school, who in your community can you reach out to and say, hey, I know that you're wrestling with some stuff right now and you're allowing yourself to be identified by all these things. And I just want to share with you that that's not who you are. That you can be so much more through Jesus. And I would say your response tonight is that you pray for God to give you the courage to step out, to live sent. That's our whole theme this year is to be sent to our friends. And I, thank you, yes, yes. Whenever we hear sent, we say out full, we scream out full send, all right? So that's your responses tonight. The first one is simply that you need to acknowledge that Jesus is greater and you start trusting. And if you want someone to pray over you like we did last week, we, we offered that, just come grab one of us, all right? We would love to lay hands and pray. If you don't want the hands, it's fine. We'll just pray over you. And the second one is simply that you would just be like, you know what? Who are the friends in my life that are hurting? And God, would you send me? Would you give me the courage and give me the words? I'm gonna pray for us. And then uh, we're gonna sing one of my favorite songs, and uh, it's going to be an awesome time of response, y'all. Dear God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for these friends. Thank you for Riley and Lucas and every leader that's in this room. God, I pray over these students that upon hearing the word, God, that they would begin to respond, that they'd sense your spirit. God, I pray for those tonight who need to start embracing the identity that they are a son or a daughter of the Most High King. And that means they're adopted and they're cared for and they're loved. They're not what all the other things going through their head or that their friends say or social media says or culture says is about them. And the second thing, God, is I pray for those in here who would say, you know what, I, I, I already trust that, I already believe that. God, I pray that you would just send them out of this place on mission because they have friends who are dying in their hallways because they don't know that their identity is not supposed to be the things of this world, but that it's what you say about them. And I, I, God, I just pray that you just send them out of this place in force, that we just witness a movement come out of this place. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah.